time to get set as special guest Dr. Joe Ball gets into what happened and what the sources said about those doomed Romans. It's the second part of the Teutoburg disaster on the Ancient History Hound podcast. Hi and welcome. My name's Neil, and as per the intro, this is the second part of the Teutoburg disaster. Initially, I had planned on one episode covering everything, but after recording, it was apparent that it was easier to split the conversation across two episodes. In part one, Dr. Joe Ball set the scene, outlining the site of the battle, the two main characters, and all the events leading up to it. If you haven't listened to part one, Dr. Ball is an expert on the Teutoburg disaster, having excavated there and written a book about it called Publius Quinctilius Varus, the man who lost three Roman legions in the Teutoburg disaster. I bought a copy and it's highly recommended. In this episode, Dr. Ball gets into how the disaster unfolded for the Romans. It does get quite harrowing at points, so just so you know. Dr. Ball outlines what we know in terms of the events, including some evidence from the finds at the site. We also unwrap the sources which both help and hinder in terms of giving us a picture of what occurred. Before we get to it all, the standard appeal for reviews and ratings. It makes a huge difference to an indie podcaster like myself, as this is largely the way new listeners get the podcast suggested to them. And you can leave reviews on any platform that you're listening to now. And in fact, if you're listening on Spotify... You can even leave comments on individual episodes, which I've just started to reply to. So thanks for all the people who've already left them. More importantly, thanks for listening. I've had some great feedback, which suggests that I have long term listeners. And whether this is your first episode listening to me or one of many, I really appreciate your support. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, X and TikTok as Ancient Blogger. And this podcast on X as at Hound Ancient. There's also the subreddit on Reddit, Ancient History Hound. If you want to email me, there's ancientblogger at hotmail.com. Finally, my website, ancientblogger.com. Oh, and I'm also Ancient Blogger on YouTube. Okay then, let's get to it. And thanks again for taking the time to listen. So it's AD 9. We've got Varus in his summer camp. So he's, oh, he's gone east over the Rhine, and he's in a summer camp. We don't know where that is exactly, do we? I mean, we've got some ideas from what I understand. Yeah, it's it's supposition at the moment, but there is a, a camp of the right period at Minden on the Weser. Mm. So that's that's probably where he is, around about that area. You know, um, either they, there could be a series of camps sort of in, in that region, but that's probably roughly where he is, where he's based for the um, for the summer. So he's not gone too far away from the Rhine, but he's also sort of exercised a bit of control and, and, and a bit of campaigning and gone, you know, a, sa- a, you know, a safe distance beyond the Rhine. Now, as I understand it, he, it's, he's in his summer camp and it's called a summer camp because he's stayed there for the summer and you want mm-hmm. to come back. Well, he makes his journey from there, intending to return back across the Rhine. And he chooses a different route. And I think this is what Arminius's great trap was. Could you explain briefly how how he changed the route and why he changed that route? Absolutely. So Arminius, as you say, we don't know what made him decide to take action against Varus and, and Rome uh, more generally. But it's something that obviously it wasn't a snap decision. It's something that's weeks, even months in the planning and possibly is, is something that's even accelerated to take, take place in AD 9 to ensure that Varus is still there so that um, Arminius can take advantage of the friendship that he has with Varus because Varus is quite complacent. There are reports for weeks or months before the battle takes place, before Arminius's betrayal takes place, that something is being plotted and that Arminius is at the heart of it. Right. People bring these intelligence reports to um, Varus saying there's something going to happen. And Varus dismisses them. He goes, no, Arminius is my friend. He's a trusted individual. Uh, he seems to almost dismiss some of these reports as people trying, people who are jealous of Arminius, who are trying to disrupt his relationship mm. 
with the Roman with the Roman um, authorities, particularly Arminius's father in law. At one point, he's the last person to try and denounce to denounce uh, Arminius to Varus. But Varus dismisses this because he knows that the father in law doesn't like Arminius and that he didn't want him to marry his daughter. And so he just he just trusts in his friendship with uh, with Arminius. And so because of this, Arminius then comes to him in the late summer with reports about a rebellion that is happening, or at least some unrest that is happening in Germany further away from the Rhine, trouble that's beyond the Cheruskian lands, but which the Cheruski people, Arminius's people, have reported to him. And Arminius pretty much advises Varus that this shouldn't be left over the winter, that it would be much better to rather than march straight back from the summer camp to say probably uh, around Minden on the Weser, rather than marching straight from there to the Rhine, it would be better to divert ever so slightly through the safe Cheruskin territory up to where this tribe is causing problems. Just quickly deal with them, you know, go in, knock some heads together uh, or just do a show of force uh, so that they know what the might of a Roman army looks like and that that'll quiet them down. And it's better to do that than to just let them cause trouble over, o- over a winter unsupervised. So Varus agrees and essentially goes to Arminius, well, you know where you're going, you lead us, you know, you, you, you take us. Hmm. And he doesn't just, I mean, one of his potential mistakes, though, is that he doesn't just take a small force, he takes the entire three legion force that he has with him. So potentially, you know, the paper strength of a legion is anywhere between five and 6,000 men. There's probably less than this because legions essentially are as big as as many soldiers as you have for them. I suspect he has got understrength legions at this point, but we're certainly talking about 10,000 plus men, plus also their camp followers. So their wives, their servants, their Mm. children as well, and all of their their baggage, which uh, I think we'll come to later. He marches them all at Arminius' suggestion and on Arminius's direction into territory that the Romans have never been to before, have absolutely no idea where they're going, and are relying entirely on Arminius's guidance along this diversion. And what they're actually doing is walking into very inhospitable terrain that has actually been prepared for an attack on them. Thanks. Yeah, I was going to talk about briefly about the size of legions. It's all I was actually going to ask you with the caveat of you can't answer this, but please try and answer it. When we talk about paper strength for legions, people will often say around 5,000. And you're absolutely right, because when I've spoken with other people in the experience that I've had researching, legion legion sizes differ hugely. And so on on paper, 5,000, reality could be 4,500, could be 4,000. Exactly, yeah. And on top of that, you've also, as I seem to remember, you've got your auxiliary forces, which numbered some four and a half thousand or thereabouts in total. Within those auxiliary forces, just to make things more complex, you can have two different sizes of auxiliary forces. You can have cohorts that are around 1,000 or a cohort that's around 500. Yeah. Which is why you sometimes get these really big figures. And in case you've ever tried reading up on how, how big the force was, you can you can see figures that range from, say, 15,000 up to 25, 30,000. We have a rough idea of, of the legions, but we don't know how, how full those legions were. And that, that comes uh, as, as a big problem. In terms of the date, though, I often see September the 7th given as a firm date as to when they struck camp. Do we have a source for that or is that a sort of speculated date? It's speculated. Uh, all we know is it is late, late summer, maybe early autumn. Mm. So it is, you know, all, all we know is that it's the point at which the summer camp has been packed up and they're heading back to winter quarters, which would, in this part of the, the world, in a place where you're not leading an active campaign, would almost certainly be the end of August. So it's, it's the dates are kind of calculated based on the likely summer camp being around sort of the Vesa and how long it would take to get to the area of the battle. Right. But we don't actually know in terms of a fixed date. I had a brief go on Google Maps as trying to work out a route back. From what I understand, they probably crossed over when they were making the march to the summer camp at Vetera, which is modern day Xanten in Germany. And presuming they were going to cross back there, that's around 98 miles mm-hmm. in terms of distance from where the events are thought to have happened. So it's quite a distance. 
And in terms of, just to give some more numbers, I, I think I mentioned his name and you've also heard of him, which is very reassuring for me. But Steve K, mm -hmm. I've mentioned him on other podcasts and other con content I've done. He's done a whole thing on Roman marching, logistics, sort of how quickly, how fast, just to give people some rough ideas. He, he estimated that a Roman army would move on a, on a Roman road at around 2.85 miles an hour. That's roughly four and a half kilometers an hour. That's on a Roman road. Mm -hmm. If you're not on a Roman road, it's considerably slower. Yep. And in terms of size, you talked about all the other people that are coming. A legionary column, again, we have, with the caveat of we don't know how full it was, with its baggage train would measure around four miles. Mm -hmm. If they were marching, I think it's six abreast. So you've got three legions. So you've probably got a column in total of around 12 miles, yep. probably a bit more than that. I think what's important to get a, a away from is this idea that you've got a small unit of Roman soldiers just marching, move towards the fact that you've got this very unwieldy column, the big snake kind of going across the landscape quite slowly, very vulnerable. It's not in the sort of order necessarily that you might expect it to have, because from what you're explaining, that Varus, Varus, sorry, wasn't totally on his on his toes on this he was a bit passive a bit lax i know that's a criticism that comes into it but we can't we can't just assume that was an incorrect criticism the least place that you want a large column in not haphazard shape but loose shape the last place you want that is a heavily forested area i just quickly want to speak though about the the germanics force the size of them do we have estimates as to how many what their size of the Germanic tribes, because I understand it was a co coalition of different tribes, what sort of size they had? They, unfortunately, based on the sources, we don't have any indication. There's no real attempt in the surviving Roman sources to quantify the size of the German forces. And it's not helped as well, both, both in terms of estimating the Roman force size and the German one, by the fact that we know that several of the German auxiliary units that are part of the Roman army defect during the battle or just mm. before it and sort of so that changes the numbers um, as well. P on a personal level, I suspect that there are probably more Germans there than there are Romans, oh. but that's t sort of taken by the end stages of the battle. At the start, I suspect it's quite a small force of uh, Germans and mm. possibly sort of just those ones who are most linked to Arminius, most trusted by him, and particularly the auxiliary units who have, who have defected. Because, of course, he's tried to keep this rebellion on a need-to-know basis. And we've already seen intelligence did get out um, yeah. to Varus, but he's trying to minimise who knows about this so that it won't reach uh, Roman ears. And so I suspect it's probably quite a small German force to start with, but that it dramatically increases over the course of the, the, the several days of battle mm. as they start to get some successes, as people who had maybe been on the fence about joining look at it and go, oh my God, they're, they're beating the Romans. Look, this, they're, they're winning, potentially. And we, we see in the sources that the German force is said to just get bigger and bigger uh, over the course of the three or four days uh, as more people kind of either hear about it and, and decide to join or who are persuaded by Arminius' successes to throw their lot in uh, with him. Hmm. But I, you know, I think there'll be thousands of, of, of Germans there and potentially by the end, they might even outnumber the, the, the Roman forces that are there. That's, I think going to the nuances of what we're discussing here, the dynamics of accruing more and more soldiers on your side. And it did make me think when Hannibal ended up, when we crossed the Alps, he's in Northern Italy. He's keen to get a battle against the Roman forces there as, as quickly as he can, purely because he wants a statement mm -hmm. for the Celtic tribes in that area to come on his side. Mm -hmm. After that initial battle at the Trebia, everyone wants to be on board with this. It mm -hmm. becomes a literal bandwagon. If you're a, a Celtic tribesman, you want to gain glory. You want a, a good story to tell. You want an item of Roman kit that you can tell the grandchildren about. Mm -hmm. This is what you want to sign up for because there's it's almost like a free for all now. And by the end of it, I do get the sense that it was it achieved a sort of critical mass with everyone and anyone just charging in, wanting to be a part of it because the odds was now so firmly stacked on the side of, of the Germanic tribes that it becomes, I, I suppose, a turkey shoot. Mm -hmm. I'm not being inconsiderate with that term, but that's what it becomes. But let's just consider then this first day. So we don't exactly know 
at what point this occurred the first day of the attack because we don't know exactly where that initial summer camp is. But on that first day, can you break down what happens? Yeah, so as you've uh, already said, you've got this sort of long, unwieldy marching column making its, its way through the German landscape. They're not particularly on alert at this point. They're, they think they're in friendly territory. They've, they've been reassured that, you know, nothing is, is, is going to happen. So we hear stories about, you know, that the soldiers, not only are they not marching in, in any kind of battle array, but, you know, they've taken their helmets off and they've slung them somewhere and they've got their wives and children marching with them. And I just thought marching without your kit on properly through territory you don't know particularly well. Oh, it just makes me, yeah. That makes my toes curl just there. Yeah, it's, it's, it's probably not his best idea. But then we don't know, you know, we don't get many descriptions of marching columns in that kind of landscape. Maybe that's maybe that's normal. We don't know, but um, prob- probably not. <laughs> but, but you know, it, it, it's certainly not something, you know, it, it's not like the soldiers were objecting to this either. They're quite happy to mm. to be in this. They're, they're not feeling under threat either. So it's Good not point. just, yeah. you know, they're feeling edgy. But Varus is saying, you know, it's fine. It's fine they're happy as well you know that they're not they don't seem to be on edge on edge either but so they're marching marching along quite happily not expecting anything to kind of land on them and then all of a sudden an attack comes and it's one of those again those misconceptions of the battle that's that are often put forward that the entire column could have been attacked at once it's probably only a small part of it that's that comes under an attack when they are probably an, uh, an opportune point in the landscape. By this point, Arminius has found an excuse to vanish away from the uh, marching column, taking quite a few of his kind of picked troops with him. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, part of this Roman marching column comes under attack from probably from both sides, from the trees lining the route that they are going through. And they just get this wave of ambush coming towards them from German warriors who are launching projectiles at them from a distance or who are sort of coming in close, throwing something or launching a very quick attack and then melting back into the um, trees so that they can't kind of be engaged with. And they just do wave after wave of this onto the uh, the Roman marching column, either the same bits uh, multiple times or at different points on the column. And we don't even know if Varus was involved in these very early stages. Oh. You know, it might have been the part of the column that he was there. It might have been a completely different one. Okay. All of a sudden, you know, there is trouble and you've got part of the column involved in this in this um, fight. But then in the way that anything happens, you know, when something bad is happening, there's rumors, there's whispers, there's people going, what's happening? Yeah. And, and all of this sort of discord being sown, all of this worry all of a sudden as these attacks just, just keep happening. And I imagine in the very first stages, they have absolutely no idea what's going on. Hmm. And they're, they're trying to sort of, you know, um, reset their brains to all of a sudden we are under attack. We thought we were safe. Um, they're scrambling to try and get themselves into order, to get themselves properly equipped up again, to get their loved ones somewhere safe where they can be defended, all while coming under this this attack that they can't put any effective resistance up against at this point. You know, they they're trying to to form up in in an effective formation but there is nothing that that can help them uh with this yeah and because they're all mixed up with the you know with the families and the camp followers and the baggage train and everybody's mixed up everywhere and they're in this confined uh landscape running between this this hill and the uh the marsh on the other side there's nowhere where they can put up even a slightly effective battle line they're just you know struggling to to cope with this kind of hit and run attack that's mm. been launched against them under completely unexpected circumstances. Oh, it must have been an absolute shock. And it's not something that a Roman army does particularly well. Or I suppose that's perhaps unfair on Roman armies. Any army doesn't do mm. particularly well, but especially the Roman army, because the Roman army, you're trained to fight in a particular way, mm-hmm. form up in a particular way, very effective. But if you're not in that formation, if you've not formed up properly, you're very vulnerable. I know it's slightly different, but for those who want to compare it to something else, again, perhaps always thinking about Hannibal, but I was thinking of the Battle of Lake Trasimene. Mm-hmm. What you have there is you have a Roman column that's traveling around the northern shore of a lake. They're out in a marching column. They're quite strung out. If you imagine a clock face. They're sort of moving from 11 o'clock through to about two o'clock. And they think two o'clock 
is where the Carthaginian camp is. So we march to near it, form up, attack the camp. However, there are about 12 o'clock on the shore and all of a sudden they get hit by Celtic warriors, mm -hmm. interestingly enough, because they're great shock troops and they hit them on the side. The column's not able to form up. You have Hannibal's cavalry at the back making sure, as I think we, we get a sense of here, that you also want to make sure that that column doesn't go anywhere it doesn't need to. Mm -hmm. So you block one end of it yeah. or you, you tag one end of it so it can't go anywhere. It doesn't have the chance to move out or escape or do anything. Mm -hmm. And at Trasimene, it's over in a few hours. Obviously here it's slightly different. It's very different in terms of the timeline. So I completely understand the shock and how it must have been in a sense. Also consider if you're a Roman soldier, now I've worn and wear occasionally Lorica Segmentata. It weighs about nine kilograms, which is 20 pounds. That's not including the helmet and the rest of the kit. It's quite heavy. It's not a type of kit that you can wear and dash off in. You're not all of a sudden going to charge out into the forests and be able to meet these guys on their terms. Yeah, absolutely. As for the Germans, what I understand from their, their geared up in, very light, perhaps if they've got you know shield, perhaps. I don't think they have armor per se. I think they've got your classic cloaks, trousers, dare I say it, that kind of a thing. And they've got javelins and they've got a spear. Mm -hmm. Put those troops on a flat plane up against a Roman formation and it's over. It's, mm -hmm. you know, they'll, they'll, get, they'll get chewed up and spat out. In the woods, in the forest, that's exactly where you want this kind of troop to be. And I, I also wonder as well, to what extent this ranged attack was there to cause as many injuries as possible. You're not necessarily there to, to kill a Roman soldier, wound him, make him now a resource that has to be looked after. You're slowing that train down even more because... They must understand at that point that this isn't the, the battle itself. This is the opening. This is how you secure the target. You put it exactly where it needs to be. And then obviously we come to the evening and they formed up, as you wrote, in their camp. Mm -hmm. We say camp, but it's probably a defensive position they've been able to, mm -hmm. to build up. And we get a sense that they were doing this while stuff was going on. Yeah, absolutely. This actually isn't that unusual because Romans were trained to do this. In fact, in the UK, you can occasionally find these camps that look like they were training camps mm -hmm. that Romans would have trained to have built whilst they're in camp, if that makes sense. They were, they were very much trained to do that. So in a way, it must have been perhaps a something of a security that here's something we can do. Yeah. So we've achieved that. So it's the first night of the attack. What's the camp like, do you think? What decisions are they making? I know it's difficult to get inside the head of anyone involved, but... What do you think their concerns were? Yeah, I mean, so you're right. I mean, they, they throw up this camp in, in it's pretty much protocol to, to do that. And they even have a system for, for how you do that while you're under attack of that you have sort of half of your troops will be defending the other half that are building the camp. Uh, so they, they've got protocols and stuff for building a camp under attack. And that's really what they try and do when caught out in an ambush. I mean, Romans don't like ambushes. When you look at later military manuals, their advice for what to do if you get caught in an ambush is essentially, well, don't, because there's, there's, nothing, you, there's nothing you can do. So, <laughs> yeah. So, great advice. Let's check what the manual says. Yeah. Oh, well, that's great. Yeah, Thanks. Just don't. They, they, they sort of go, you, you won't win if you're, if you're in an ambush for exactly the reasons that you said, of that you, when you have light armed mobile infantry against a Roman legionary, it's very different when you're in an ambush uh, compared to on a pitched battlefield. And so they're aware that they need to try and get out of this situation as quickly as possible. But they, they're aware they don't know where they're going. They don't want to just panic, react to this. And so, as you say, they build the camp and sort of go in there and try to work out what to do in the face of this. Now, other Roman armies, when they've been caught in a similar situation... Fifth Legion, uh, when it was caught during Caesar's Gallic Wars, we see sometimes they even give up in the in the face of something like this. So in the instance in, in Gaul during the Gallic Wars, a Roman legion is caught in a similar situation where it had been ambushed and it goes back to a camp that it had recently abandoned. They look out at the enemy surrounding them and they go, we've got absolutely no chance. And they kill themselves rather than try and face the rather than face the enemy. Wow. Yeah, so they, they just sort of commit mass, uh, mass suicide or they, they kill each other because they don't want to face this battle mm. that uh, they don't feel that they'll be able to get out of. But we don't see that with Varus. 
what we see is, you know, they've built this camp, they rest for the night, and they start putting a plan together for how they're going to try and get out of this situation. And I think that's one of the things that reveals that Varys is actually not just a competent uh, military commander, but he is trusted by his men still at this point. Mm. It's not like they've gone, oh, we've been led into this ambush by this incompetent lawyer who's, you know, doesn't know anything about the military and Mm. uh, nobody tries to take command from him. Nobody argues with him. Uh, He's still very much in command of the army at this point. And really, they're faced with two choices. They can choose to try and go backwards and go back to where they have just left in the direction of their summer camp, which has the advantage of that it is terrain they've already passed through. So they might have at least some familiarity with it, but it has the disadvantage of taking them further away from safety. The other alternative is to push onwards even though they don't know the terrain, but just to try and break through this ambush to either get to an area of clear ground, an open ground, where they can maybe put a proper battle formation up and take the Germans on in a way that plays to Roman strengths, or they can just try and outpace the ambush and reach safety on the the Rhine. And Varus evidently decides that the latter choice is, is the option, that he's going to keep moving forward, that he's going to try and push through the through the landscape and mm. to outpace the, the ambush. And this is exactly what he's supposed to do. You know, this, this is protocol in the situation. He's very much following the military uh, rules at this point. Yeah. Even though he's in a, you know, a disadvantageous situation, one of his big problems is that all of his scouting units seem to have defected to Arminius. So he doesn't really have many people who he can send forward to go and scope out the landscape that they're going to be marching into. And those that he does send just get rounded up and killed by the Germans. So he doesn't know what he's going into, but he evidently decides to push forwards. When you mentioned Arminius then, has he realised at this point that Arminius has betrayed him? Or does he still think he's out there somewhere? Well, we don't know because because we don't know how prominent Arminius would have been at this stage. Mm. I personally, you know, it, this is my uh, supposition, but I think that by this point, He's, it's beginning to dawn on him that Arminius is, is part of yeah. this. In the early stages, I'm sure he's thinking, well, Arminius is out there. He can come and he can ward this ta- attack off us. Maybe when Arminius doesn't turn up, he thinks, oh, no, he's been killed. But at some point, probably on this night, he's going to start getting intelligence that Arminius has been seen on the enemy side um, somewhere on the battlefield either this night or, or potentially the, the, the next one over the next course of the next day or night. But I think combined with the fact that he had been warned about Arminius, you know, planning to uh, launch an attack on him, that there was a conspiracy against Rome. Mm. I'm sure that by this point, he's starting to put the pieces together, even if maybe he can't bring himself to imagine that Arminius is actually the architect of this at this point. But I suspect it's a Mm. dawning realization that actually he was wrong and everybody that had warned him about Arminius was right. Mm. And it's here that must have been must have been an awful feeling. Oh, must yeah. have just been so so awful. But as you say, and I think it's a really important point you make. Initially, this happens, but the Romans carry on. Yeah, they're able to fall back on their training and also respect a virus. So it's not all lost just yet. Or rather, if it is lost, they still think that it can be saved. And I think that's a really important point. But what they then do, as I understand it is that they destroy the baggage train because they realise now we've got to move quick. We can't have something that's going to slow us down. And that's a, for me, that's a huge thing to do, mainly because when you think about logistics for the army, that's something I'm always interested in doing. To give people some, a very rough idea, again, this is something that I think came from Steve Kay, but I've seen it read elsewhere. You're looking at about 1.3 kilograms of rations for a soldier a day. You're looking at about five to six litres of water a day for a legionary, although at the same time, probably more because they're fighting, they're exercising, they're wearing heavy armour in what we now understand as being very sodden. It had been raining heavily, Mm -hmm. so it's going to take a lot of effort to get through there. Just think about that times by several thousand. I mean, just a legion itself, that's that's a lot of resources that you'd need. Uh, If you think about in terms of liters of water, again, with the, with the premise that you've got 5,000 men in a legion, 25,000 liters of water a day needed. 
and seven and a half thousand kilograms of foodstuffs mm -hmm. needed. You're leaving a lot of that behind now. You're carrying what you can take with you. You've still got, again, assuming that you're going to Vetera, which I think was Anton, which I think is their possible way back. You're looking at 98 miles to march. Mm -hmm. And if you're thinking you could put down 16 miles a day, that's still a fair few days. So you're probably realizing at that time, you've just got to take enough to survive for the next few days and you can work out after that what you can do with it. So they've now moved very much from an army that was marching out of formation with a baggage train, perhaps a bit lax, to what we would expect a Roman legion to be. But mm -hmm. they're, still, they're still moving through very inhospitable terrain. Mm -hmm. and they're still realizing that an attack's going to come. But can you give us a, an overview of what happens next? Perhaps talk about the fortifications, the trap, as it were, mm -hmm. I think is very interesting. And how we achieve the wonderfully horrific term that you use in the book, tactical disintegration, where it, it is effectively game over. Yeah, so after they've had this sort of disastrous first night in, in, in this camp and they're sort of trying to put themselves together and, and, and decide this plan, and as you say, abandoning their, um, their baggage trade, which probably had a lot of superfluous stuff in it. I mean, you know, they're, they're coming from a summer camp where they would have had one of the luxury. They've got souvenirs. <laughs> but even we found, we found on the battlefield later, you know, there's, there's elements of statues, there's fittings from sort of beds and things. There's a lot of oh, luxury. Wow, okay items so you can domestic imagine items then there's a lot of domestic stuff that you sort oh. of call camp goods and things so they're probably abandoning the vast majority of those uh as well because they're sort of going we're in a fight for our lives i don't care about the statue of venus you know let's leave it behind it's fine keep the one of mars but yes. ditch the one of venus yeah absolutely <laughs> but so yes yeah, so they they decamp uh there's probably another day in the middle where they are fighting again just to try and break th free of this ambush and again, do the same thing of just building a camp at the end of the day. We don't really have any details about what they're doing on, on that day, apart from just trying to outpace this ambush amidst this autumn storm that's, that's come up. As you say, it's raining, it's windy. They can't, their shields become sodden. They can't use uh, some of their equipment. Mm. They must have been really bedraggled and, and miserable by this point, in addition to sort of fighting for their lives. On either the third or fourth day, um, again, the sources unfortunately aren't aren't too clear, but they reach the end stages of this battle. And I think it's remarkable actually that they got this far. You know, as, yeah, as you say, they, completely. they are not an army who just give up at the first sign of adversity. They fight through at least two days of coming under this kind of attack, just not knowing when the next wave of projectiles is going to come out of the forest towards them, mm. but of just trying to inch their way forward um, to safety. And they, you know, they, they maintain cohesion in, in for at least two days, managing to, to stay together as a tactical unit, as something that is effective in the field. They just can't ever break through to somewhere where they can put an effective opposition to the, um, to the Germans up. They keep finding sort of a clearing and thinking, oh, great, this is going to be where we can make a stand. And then it's just not big enough. And mm. so they end up having to plunge back into the forest um, again. On the third or the, or the fourth day, this is when we see the battle finally coming to a, a culmination. This is the area that's been excavated in the greatest depth of the um, battlefield. And it centers around uh, a site uh, in the modern day called Kelkreza. And particularly a part of that called the Oberesh, which is where a lot of the excavations have taken place and where there is a fantastic museum as well dedicated to the finds from the battlefield. And this is an area that Arminius has worked out that the Romans are going to have to pass through if they want to try and get back to the Rhine. He's been funneling them towards this point. It's an area of very limited passable terrain. It's an area where the passage between the mountain and the marshy area narrows to its, its most difficult point. And the Romans are sort of funneled into this by the German attacks to find that a specific area has been prepared for them by Arminius, where he's potentially wanting to put this battle to a final end. 
And what he's done is constructed some wooden fortifications, so a palisade on top of a, a kind of turf rampart, behind which the German warriors are waiting for the Romans to arrive so that they can launch attacks on them from a height and the Romans are going to be unable to respond by this point. Now, this is something, it's not documented in the um, historical record, but it's actually something that came out during archaeological excavations at the site. Oh. And it's something that hadn't, hadn't really been seen anywhere wow. else in, in this kind of, uh, of warfare. And it seems completely revolutionary. There are mm. some people who try and have tried to interpret the remains instead as a Roman camp that was built on the site. But it's problematic because there is absolutely no Roman material found behind the rampart. It's yeah. all in front of it. So it's almost certainly not, not a Roman construction. But what it is, is it, it is Arminius and his men, again, making use of their know-how from being in the Roman army of how to construct these kind of field fortifications and to prepare ground in this way. And so what they've done is create something which essentially means that the Romans are surrounded when they get to this point and the battlefield. They can't go backwards because you've got the rest of the marching column behind you. You can't go forwards because there's Germans and marshes and, and harshness. And to the side, you've got this German rampart. They're launching attacks on you. You've got absolutely no way to, to reply to this by this point. When you look at the Roman finds that are, are discovered on this part of the battlefield, there's absolutely no projectiles left. Um, it looks like they've already used almost all of their projectile kit. Oh. So they're just sitting ducks in this area. Their yeah. swords and, and the, the handheld weapons that they've got are absolutely no use because they're not getting within arm's distance mm. of, these, of their attackers. And so they're essentially just sitting ducks in this area, just having these, la these attacks launched down on them. And this is the point where Roman resolve quite understandably breaks down mm. and they go into a phase of what in modern warfare is recognized as tactical disintegration. And I think that's exactly what we see here in this instance mm. as well. Of the soldiers, they don't just, they don't try to surrender in, in many cases. They just sort of suddenly, the reality of their situation just overwhelms them. And they become, you know, their last hope of trying to escape this, this attack has just been closed off right in front of them. And they're seeing their comrades dropping on either side and they know that it's their turn, you know, next, that there yeah. finally is no escape from this. Not if, when. Exactly. You know, some of the cavalry troops, they try and, and, and escape by riding off to, uh, away from the main, the main army. They're cut down by German cavalry. So there's, there's just no mm. escape at this point. But they don't do what you would sort of expect in a, a normal defeat, I suppose, where you would see people, you know, throwing down their weapons and trying to surrender and trying to buy their lives. They almost go into a dissociated state, some of them. They recognize the situation. Varus recognizes the situation as well. He looks around at this situation. He's still alive to this late point in the battle. Okay. He, like most of his men, is, is wounded by this point. Mm. And he is concerned about falling into captivity. He doesn't want to be captured by the um, Germans. Yeah. And so he kills himself, which the sources variously, some of them are critical of this because they say he's still got men alive and he shouldn't have tried to kill himself. Other ones go, well, he's a Roman commander. That's what they're supposed to do. They're not supposed to fall into, into yeah. uh, enemy hands. And when the news goes around the surviving Roman soldiers that Varus has killed himself, along with several others of his prominent officers, that's kind of the last straw for them. Mm. They go, it's absolutely hopeless now. And we don't even have Varus, he, you know, he's, he's not with us anymore. And so a lot of them do the same. Right. They either throw down their weapons, uh, they, they, they kill themselves, or some of them, they just drop everything and they just stand there waiting to be, waiting to be killed by the enemy. They don't, wow. they don't try and fight back anymore. They just sort of go into this complete absent state where they're just not trying to fight anymore. They are completely overwhelmed by the situation. It's, it's almost like a massive psychological wound that they've, they've sustained, realizing we are not going to get out of this. And like I say, they don't, some of them try to, to try to fight on. And we know that some of them do escape from the um, battlefield, but a large chunk of them, yeah, they just completely go to pieces and 
that's really the end of the battle with, with these soldiers sort of giving up and just allowing the enemy to cut them down where they stand. It's a pitiful scene. What you're describing is horrific. Mm -hmm. And again, I think it's really important for people to realise that this was a sequence of events that are built up to this point. And it had taken a sequence of events to build up to this point. You didn't get the Romans into this state just from an ambush. You have to break them down. And once you've broken them down, then that's it. And I, I think this speaks a lot to the organisation of the Romans, but it also speaks a great deal to how well orchestrated Germanic tribes, they'd done their homework. What you seem to have described towards the end was a complete breakdown in the chain of command. And I think it's really important to understand that as a condition of the Roman army. Chain of command was incredibly important. It was why Rome was able to field its armies and their armies be as effective as they were. But it wasn't just the Romans. This might sound a bit strange, but when we look at Sparta, Often when we look at Sparta or talk about Spartan armies, people talk or, or consider the fact that they had incredible six packs and they're all incredible. They're all basically mini Chuck Norrises who are able to take on several opponents at once. Not really the case as such. What was more the case was the Spartan army was very effective. It was very well drilled and it was also had a very good chain of command. And both Xenophon and Thucydides mentioned how good the chain of command was within the Spartan army. When it was deploying, everyone knew what to do. But also, if you needed to change something, it could be done. Whereas you didn't have that so much with the other hoplite armies because they were, in a sense, amateur. They didn't have the drilling. They didn't have that chain of command. You had that with the Spartan army. And that's one of those things that really goes under the radar when we consider how effective they were. Same with Rome. But of course, once you get rid of that chain of command, and I think this is where we start to see it, right in that last day or so, that's where it's broken down. So the Romans have been absolutely defeated at this point. Do we have survivors? Do we know about survivors that made it from this? So there are some survivors. I mean, that's one of the misconceptions about this battle is that every Roman was killed. And that's not quite the case. Um, obviously, it is a very, very high casualty rate, mm. but it's not quite everybody. And there are sort of three groups of survivors, really. We have some people who are actually ca taken captive on the, um, the battlefield. So not everybody that, that is found there is, is killed on, on the battlefield. Some of them are uh, taken prisoner. Uh, in a very gory account by a writer called Florus, he describes the torture and execution of quite a lot of these, um, these captive Romans, mm -hmm. where he sort of talks about one of them being tied to a tree and then having his tongue ripped out and a German sort of saying to him, oh, now Viper, you will cease to hiss. Or, and, and, you know, all of these accounts of yeah. them being put into torture pits or, or burial pits or being nailed to trees and things. And that get, gets picked up in the historian Tacitus when he describes a visit that's made to the battlefield six years later by a different Roman army. He talks about the site that they find and, you know, these skulls scattered around and nailed to trees and all of these bodies just lying around this, this, this forest grove. Mm. So it's clearly that there, there are some soldiers who survive the initial, you know, ending of the battle, but are killed uh, very soon afterwards uh, as, as kind of human sacrifices. Mm. But not all of them were, were evidently killed in this immediate aftermath. Some of them ended up as German slaves. Mm. And we know this because in later campaigns into Germany under the Emperor Claudius very early on in his reign, uh, a Roman army that is campaigning in this same area, finds a group of Roman soldiers who had been taken captive oh. in this battle uh, and that they've been living as German slaves uh, ever since, and he frees them. So, so they're, they're, oh. they're freed by, by this, this Roman army. And so we know then that some soldiers that were captured at the battle not only survive, but they, they go into slavery and they survive for decades in German slavery as well. So they, you know, there are some survivors on, on that side. There are some that manage to get away from the battlefield entirely, though, and actually get to safety back on the uh, Rhine and get back to Roman territory. And we know this because unbelievably, some of them stay with the Roman army and actually go back to the site oh. in, six years later, this in, in the expedition that's described by Tacitus, the one where he finds the groves with all of the skulls yeah. and things, they actually go back. And this is a, an expedition that's being led by uh, Germanicus, the 
person yeah. who possibly would have been emperor yeah. well, during his German campaigns that he's conducting to punish Arminius. And these men, they, they show him around. They go, this is, where, this is where our first camp was. And this is where Varus killed himself. And this is what happened here. And this is what happened there. So they go back to the, to, to the site and, and they show him, show him around. And the fact that they know a lot of the, or they seem to know, a lot of these locations associated with the end stages of the battle suggest that they, they didn't just flee at the very earliest opportunity. They actually got away from this, this, this last stage yeah. of the battle. And really, when I've sort of been trying to puzzle this out, I mean, you can imagine really if you've got, say, a group of, you know, maybe your Contabernium eight man group or something, if there's yeah. a f- handful of you left from that, you're a unit, you can probably fight your way through yeah. once it's gone into this state of disintegration and there's a lot easier targets on the on the battlefield you know mm. six men sort of still armed and still able to fight are potentially going to be able to slip away during this this chaos yeah that that's complete supposition on, on, on my part but i strongly think that that's that's what they're doing and there are beginning to be archaeological indicators of maybe isolated instances of further battle happening away beyond the battlefield that are maybe some of these smaller units or these smaller groups of men trying to break off and and sort of to get away so it's you know it's um there are some survivors but they're very much in the uh, in the minority just a point on what you were saying about people being able to make it away and be able to perhaps fight their way way out of it all it's just come to mind so i haven't got the reference off the top of my head but i remember it was credited to socrates who fought one of the battles i think would have been against Thebes and the Peloponnesian War. But anyway, the Athenians get beaten and he's credited because he's told the group that he's in, don't run back, retreat in order. Mm-hmm. Because if you're, a, if you're someone who's hunting down, as it were, or, or yeah, hunting down the enemy, you don't want to go up against anyone who looks like they might be able to handle themselves mm-hmm. because what would be the point in that? I've got option A, which is a small group of soldiers who look like they're in order and look like they might get a bit pointy around me Mm -hmm. or i've got these other guys that are like the four of them that are running away that don't seem armed that are panicking i know which ones that i'm going after yeah so i think there's there's possibly a bit of that going on but that's interesting i didn't know about claudius and that that is that is fascinating to hear that he had still had survivors so arminius has won this great victory what does he actually do with it where does it go from here so We've sort of got a mixture of, of the archaeology and the history for kind of trying to put together what Arminius, what Arminius is doing. So we know from the site itself that they start looting it almost straight away, but they go for the very precious metals and materials and things. They, they've clearly got priorities. And I think for, it, it's conducted in a very rushed kind of way. And I think that they're, they're half expecting at this point that another Roman army of reinforcements is going to turn up really quickly. Yeah, and so yeah. they evacuate the battlefield pretty quickly. Um, they, they just sort of take the, the best goods and then they, they, they go and they sort of return a couple of weeks later <clears throat> when it's clear that a Roman army isn't going to come after them and they loot the site more thoroughly. So we can see kind of this two phase response in terms of Arminius. He starts trying to sweep forward to, to kind of capitalize on his victory. And he keeps moving his men uh, forward towards other Roman, Roman positions, um, particularly the Fort of Aliso, which is almost certainly Halton in um, modern Germany. And these German forces start lay siege to there. And it looks like they're going to sort of try and overwhelm Roman positions throughout the, the t- German territories east of the Rhine. And potentially, you know, try and, and, and drive the Romans out of this, uh, of this area permanently. There's a lot of worry uh, among the, the legions on the Rhine that there's going to be too many Germans sort of approaching them and that they're going to not be able to hold the frontier. And even in Rome, there are worries when the news about this battle uh, reaches them. They're very concerned that Arminius will have put together this massive German army that by the time they even get the news of this defeat in Rome, will already be over the Rhine frontier, already causing problems in, in Gaul. And they're actually worried about Arminius you know, leading an army to the gates of Rome. You know, they're, they're absolutely terrified about, about the potential consequences of this. As it turns out, Arminius is not able particularly to capitalize on his victory. They don't manage even to take the fort at Aliso. 
which is held very capably and very effectively by Varus's nephew, who he had brought with him part of his provincial staff. Uh, and so they managed to to rally themselves at, at Aliso and at various other installations. And they do manage to to stop any German advance, at which point Arminius sort of becomes not not less of a threat, but less of an immediate threat, I suppose. You know, mm. they, they manage to uh, control it relatively well. And within uh, a very short space of time, uh, an emergency force has been levied and uh, mobilized unwillingly among the, some of the uh, elites of Rome. Augustus has to force men to serve in this emergency levy. <laughs> By saying, if you don't, you know, if you're if you're of eligible age, and he makes that up to about forty, so it, it vastly extends the the age requirements for this. And he says, if you don't go and and fight in this emergency force with Tiberius against Arminius, I'll take all your stuff. Yeah, you know, I'll confiscate all of your belongings. <laughs> and then some of them go, stuff it. We don't care. Take it. I'm not going to Germany. He even <laughs> executes some people because they won't go and serve in oh. this emergency levy. So there is there is a panic, but between the Roman forces that are already in Germany and then this army that starts to arrive under Tiberius, um, they hold the situation. Uh, as soon as Arminius lo- learns that Tiberius is bringing a new army to the region, he sort of steps backwards and, and yeah. no longer sort of launches attacks against the frontier. So really what happens after the initial success is that Armini- Arminius doesn't seem to be able to have moved that to some to a higher threat level. He's inflicted an incredible defeat on Rome, but it also shows that Rome can respond to these kind of crises quite well, even if they are quite comprehensive. So Arminius doesn't really do much with this. And I think he he ends up being assassinated several years after the event. This was his big achievement. And mm-hmm. that, in a way, was it. He didn't build a great deal on this. As we're coming to the end of the episode, what I wanted to quickly do is, if you could talk about the sources that we have, and the problems with the sources, because when I came across doing the research that I've done for this, obviously I read your book and we'll read it again, but I looked at some other accounts and some of the accounts, and these are not sources, these are sort of modern accounts, are very detailed, which led me to think that there it wasn't so much fabrication, but there'd been a lot of flesh put on the bones. Mm-hmm. Because when I looked at the source material that you've outlined in your book, there's not a great deal that's said about it. Perhaps the best thing, and I think you mentioned it earlier, would have been to have Pliny's work on this. We'd know a great deal more. We don't have that. So what do we have then? And what are the problems with what we have? So, yeah, I mean, you're quite right. Pliny the Elder's History of the German Wars. If When people say if there's one document that you could find from antiquity. That, that's oh, that's survived, yours, is it? That's mine. That's Absolutely yours. 100%. If, if they could find <laughs> that, you know, I don't even care if it proves everything I've ever written so far wrong. I just want it so, so much. But so we really have, we have four main sources for this um, battle, none of which give us the, the ability to reconstruct the battle in terms of what day it happened or what time of day something happened. But, you know, they, they still allow us to put together uh, a comprehensive narrative overview of the battle, especially in conjunction with the archaeology. So our best source is uh, written by Cassius Dio who writes the the most extended narrative uh, or surviving narrative of the battle, probably based on Pliny as well. He's the only writer who uh, has this kind of detailed narrative, and I'm almost certain that it's kind of paraphrasing what Pliny had written. So it's the most detailed account in terms of the narrative and, and details within it, but it's also the weakest one in that it's the latest account that we have. So it's written almost 200 years after the battle took place, and it's got various other kind of narrative considerations and historical points that he's trying to make uh, within the wider narrative. So it's the most detailed in terms of, of, of the story, but it is problematic. We have uh, an account by Valeus Paterculus, which is the earliest account. So it's very useful in, in that level because he's actually a contemporary of these events. He would have known Varus. He would have been he's part of the Roman military at the time that the, um, the battle takes place. So he would know a lot of the kind of insider stories and the gossip that comes out of this battle. Unfortunately, he hasn't produced an incredibly biased account when it comes to uh, Varus because he doesn't like him. Yeah, he, he doesn't seem to like Varus on a on a personal level. They would have known each other, and Valerius Paterculus he makes a lot of his own relationship with Tiberius, 
And I think potentially there's a bit of jealousy there of going, well, that Varus is Tiberius's former brother-in-law, was co-consul. They're probably friends. And I think that Valais Paterculus really doesn't like Varus on a, on a personal level, which uh, undermines uh, a lot of his accounts. You know, he, he's quite vicious. He's the one that says that Varus is corrupt, that he's mm. useless, that he, he's the one who criticizes him for killing himself. So it, it's a useful account in terms of it's, it's, you know, a contemporary account, but it is, is problematic because of these biases that he's brought to it. We have a very brief account of the battle in Floris, where he just really concentrates on people being tortured and the nasty things that happen to, <laughs> to the Roman soldiers. So it, it's, okay. a, you know, it's a great passage to read if you want to be horrified by, by what happens to prisoners of war in, in the Roman world, but otherwise it doesn't really help us that much. And then we have a short passage in Tacitus, which doesn't actually cover the battle itself, because of course he doesn't start writing until the end of the uh, reign of Augustus and the start of Tiberius's. But what it contains is an account of the battlefield as it did when Germanicus visits it six years later. And so from that, we can reconstruct some of the events of the battle. And then also when Germanicus is campaigning in the same areas against Arminius himself, there's a lot of referring back to the events under Varus. So a Roman army under Germanicus will say, get bogged down in the mud. And Arminius will go, see, it's like Varus's army. The same thing's happening again. Right. So we can sort of pick those details, pick those details out. And sort of he's the one that has a ghost story about Varus appearing to Germanicus in his dreams as this blood-soaked, marshy Ooh. individual who rises up and is beckoning Germanicus towards him with one, sorry, be not Germanicus, uh, one of his commanders is beckoning them towards him. Uh, as, as if he wants them to join him in, in this gruesome defeat in, in Germany. So there's some interesting details and stuff from that in, mm. in Tacitus, even though he doesn't concentrate on the actual battle itself. And then, of course, we have the archaeology, yeah. which has just you know, fleshed it out incredibly. Yeah. To me, that's the great thing, because I think we're more likely to find more things archaeologically than we are. You always hold out hope, mm -hmm. but source material, yeah, we always hope we might be able to find something. And just on the sources, you've done a really, really good job there, not just of giving us an account of the sources, but also introducing perhaps people who don't necessarily realise this, just how biased and prejudiced those sources can be. Mm -hmm. So I think what you've done there is really given people who aren't necessarily that experienced in that regard a guide of just how if you don't like someone because you're jealous of them, you can just paint them really badly and you can say all these things about them. There's always that to contend with. But it's interesting that we're able to build up some form of a picture. And like you say, I think the, the archaeology is the thing that will introduce us to more of the truth of the situation. And that actually leads me on a, on a neat segue to my last question. So first of all, I want to say thank you so much for, for being on this episode. It's been absolutely fantastic. It may be a two-parter. So if you're listening to this and this is the second part, you, you better have listened to the first part. <laughs> so my question to you is this. You're going back to the battlefield. You can find any one item. What would that item be that you you find on the battlefield? I think because there's still this controversy, I mean, it, it's increasingly being put to bed, but of whether the battlefield is actually associated with Varus or whether it's maybe from Germanicus's campaign. So what I'd really like to find is something with Varus's name on it, would be if we could find something. Wow. What might that be? You know, a piece of kit or you find from other sites sort of military decorations and stuff that have the name of a, of a, a legaton or a, a commander. Yeah. So if we could find something like that with his name on or if we couldn't have that, because I'm aware that that's probably asking, uh, asking quite a lot. But if we could find something maybe inscribed with one of the names of the legions that were involved, so the, the 17th, yeah. 18th or 19th, that would be fairly conclusive that this was, in fact, the, the virus battlefield of which, as I say, there is some controversy less now because of recent work that's been, that's been carrying on. Mm. For me, it's 100% the battlefield, but you have to allow for slim possibility. So yeah, so something with, with one of the legionary names on would be, would be absolutely fantastic. And, and that's one of the things about archaeology is it's not necessarily the big finds no. that tell us the most important bits of the story. It's the small thing. But if we could find yeah. something that's got the 17th legion inscribed on it, even if it's just a pickaxe or something, mm. that would be my dream find. Boring, I know. Sorry. No, no, it's not boring at all. 
but yeah, I mean, the armor that they found there just a couple of years ago that has just been on yeah. display in the British Museum. I, mean, I went and saw it. I went and saw yeah, it. Yeah, me too. And it's absolutely fantastic. And I mean, mm. in some ways, that's the great thing about this site is that it's got so much more to reveal. And it's probably yeah. more fantastic than anything I can actually answer you because the idea mm. that we'd find a full set of Lorica with indications that a person had been in it at the time it had been buried. Yeah. I mean, I would have never imagined you could find that. I'll make you a deal. When you find the thing that you will find, when you get your wish list, I'll get you back on the podcast and you can talk about it. Deal. When you find that <laughs> that virus, the, something with virus's name on it, virus was here, I don't know, whatever that is in Latin, <laughs> but then you'll come back and we can have a discuss that. But look, I just wanted to say thanks again. It's been absolutely fascinating. I had a great experience reading your book because it taught me a great deal. It did what I think a good book should always do. It should correct you in what you don't understand and educate you where it needs to, and it does that. So again, I'm not on commission, but if you go and you can find Dr. Joe Ball's book on Varus, please do. It's well worth a read. Where can people find you? I will try and put some links in at the beginning of my introduction, but if people want to come and ask you some more questions, where, where can they get hold of you? Absolutely. So I'm across various different social medias. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Blue Sky, and very recently uh, TikTok, all at yep. the handle at Dr. Uh, D-R-J-E Ball. If you follow me, I follow Dr. Ball, and I think we've had some recent discourse. I'll certainly be pushing out the information about this episode or episodes on my Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, you name it, everywhere else. But I just want to say a big thank you, Dr. Joe, for coming on. And fingers crossed that you find something on your wish list. That's great. Thank you so much for having me. And I hope people have gone away with a different view of virus. That's all I'm aiming to do. Thank you so much.